Good afternoon, everyone. It's Sandy Dunn speaking. I'm the Knowledge Translation Specialist with Born Ontario, and I'm here to welcome you today to our uh, regular uh, Born Provincial Rounds, our March session. We're very, very pleased to uh, welcome two guest speakers today for a very interesting uh, presentation entitled, Can Me Measuring Normal Birth Help Keep Birth Normal? And I'll introduce our speakers in just a moment. I'd just uh, like to let you know a couple of things before we begin. Uh, this session will be recorded and the webinar will be posted along with the slides uh, and accessible on our BORN website for future use if any of your colleagues have not uh, been able to uh, attend today. We're going to ask the speakers to work through their presentation and the information they have uh, prepared for us today first and then post a uh, question and answer period at the end of the session like we normally do. So if you could just be patient uh, till the end with your questions. You uh, will be able to type your questions into the chat box on the left-hand side of the screen. Uh, you'll see a little chat symbol there. Uh, so please just keep your questions in mind. Uh, type them in there and then we will go through the sequence of questions uh, and pose them to our guest speakers. Um, uh, as they come up. So without further ado then, I'd like to introduce our uh, two very special speakers for today. First of all, Vicki Van Wagner. Uh, Vicki is a midwife in Toronto and in Nunavik, Quebec. She's an associate professor at Ryerson University Midwifery Education Program. She was actually the first director of that midwifery program at Ryerson from 1993 to 1998. She is on staff at Mount Sinai Hospital and uh, a member of the Ontario Maternal and Newborn Advisory Committee. Uh, she was the co-chair of Ontario Maternity Care Expert Panel appointed by the Ontario Women's Health Council to advise the Ontario Ministry of Health on maternity care policy from 2004 to 2006. And her research interests include evidence-based practice, and normal birth and northern and aboriginal midwifery and clinical education. And Vicki has been uh, uh, a, a advocate and a real um, expert involved in helping Bourne uh, work with uh, establishment of the midwifery data and midwifery reports. Our second speaker is uh, another colleague who has uh, actually participated in Bourne Provincial Rounds before. Liz Darling uh, co-presented last fall a session on the birth centers, and she's back with us this session. She, if you will remember any of those of you who were on the line, Liz has been a registered midwife since 1997 and currently practices in Ottawa. She's an assistant professor in the midwifery education program at Laurentian University. She has a master's degree in health research methodology from McMaster University and she's currently a doctoral candidate in population health at the University of Ottawa. Liz was actively involved in the creation of Born Ontario and continues to play an ongoing role in Born's research and quality improvement endeavors through committee work. She's also been involved with perinatal data collection at the national level, and she's currently a member of the Canadian Perinatal Surveillance Systems Expert Advisory Committee. So without further ado then, I'll hand over the uh, the session to Vicki and Liz, um, and um, we welcome their presentation on Does Defining uh, Measuring Normal Birth Keep Birth Normal? Vicki and Liz, over to you. Thank you so much. Do you want to say hi, Liz? Sure, oh, I just had to unmute my line. Hi. Can you hear me? You sound good. Okay, great. Um, I'll start, and um, I'm going to first uh, talk a bit about the kind of hows and whys of defi defining normal birth, and uh, then um, Liz is going to talk more in relation to what we're trying to do uh, with BORN and midwifery data uh, in terms of uh, defining and measuring normal birth. Um, what, what I hope to accomplish today is to acquaint you with the many different kinds of normal birth statements that exist. Um, there are all sorts of terms that are used to describe what we're calling for the, our purposes today normal birth. Um, you're probably all very familiar with the fact that some people may call 
uh, use normal birth and natural birth interchangeably. Some of us like the term physiologic birth. There's a whole literature on a concept which is called optimal birth. Recently, the term biological is being used in some of the statements. And uh, as to convey this kind of uh, ideal of a normal natural birth, other terms like undisturbed or salutogenic are also used in the literature. And uh, since the mid-90s, uh, there's been uh, many different normal birth statements. I'm going to review some of them today, um, but not all of them. Uh, but just to make you aware, and it is some interesting research if you're interested in this topic, they're usually quite brief, um, but all the definitions have variation, and I think that's one of the, uh, the important themes that will come out today. So the WHO, um, uh, the uh, NHS has a statement that was jointly authored by the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists in the UK and the Royal College of Midwives. The International Confederation of Midwives has a statement. Many of you will be familiar with the 2008 uh, SOGC statement that was jointly endorsed by many of the other maternity care provider groups. The Canadian Association of Midwives has a statement on normal birth. Uh, more than one, actually. And um, uh, there are statements in New Zealand and um, uh, one uh, from New South Wales in Australia. Probably you're all very aware that one of the reasons for this focus and this idea that we need position statements or public documents that help to define and uh, one of the important goals of most of the statements is to promote normal birth, is um, that all over the world uh, it's become headlines. This is a headline from September 2004 in the Globe and Mail. Uh, this article by Andre Picard followed uh, the publication of the Canadian Institute for Health Information um, uh, report on giving birth in Canada in uh, 2004. So basically what the headlines say here is that natural birth is no longer the norm. So raising the question of is normal birth still normal and do we need to do something about that um, given the uh, increase in rates of intervention uh, in childbirth uh, in most places in the world. Um, but there was, have been so many statements that have come out um, that this article followed the publication of the SOGC statement uh, in the journal uh, Birth. And uh, this is Diane Young saying, um, what is normal childbirth and do we need more statements about it? She's asking the question in this really interesting editorial uh, about whether these statements really are serving uh, uh, us. Why are we publishing them and where are they getting us? Um, so let's talk about many of the statements uh, or a few of the statements uh, one by one. Uh, and what I want to look at here is some of the detail and the variation in the definition. Um, really to try and contribute to a dialogue amongst maternity care providers about how should we define normal birth? Is it helpful to have a, a kind of a set in stone definition? How much flexibility do we need in the definition? And uh, if we measure it, uh, what can we accomplish? Um, so the WHO says, I think, pretty much what most of you would expect, that normal birth is starts spontaneously. Um, that uh, it's low risk um, prenatally and throughout, um, that the baby is born spontaneously, it's vertex, it's term, and the mother and baby are both in good condition. Now, this probably makes inherent sense to many of you, but you can probably see already that there are, is some further definition before we could, needed before we could start to, uh, to measure any of these things. Um, the International Confederation of Midwives is one of the other international bodies that has a statement. And it, like many of the other midwifery organizations um, uh, in the world, uh, focuses a lot on how to achieve normal birth, perhaps more importantly than how to define it. Um, 
And uh, so it talks about the need for midwifery-led care, one-to-one -one support, interdisciplinary collaboration, choice of birthplace, um, and access to water in labor. Um, it also really sets out for midwifery associations that they need to work with policymakers to help promote normal birth. Um, and uh, this is detailed a little bit more that it's the role of midwives uh, within their healthcare systems to promote normal birth, um, to work to enhance the skills of midwives, uh, to improve practice around normal birth. Um, very importantly, as well as this kind of awareness and skill on the part of the midwife, midwives are, are given the task of uh, establishing and using healthcare indicators uh, in order to evaluate the results of midwifery practice in normal childbirth. And what we're going to end up talking about in the end, end of the presentation today is really, I think, how um, midwives in Ontario and Born Ontario are trying to work together to establish that particular goal that the International Confederation has set out for us. Um, this obviously is going to help with research and also hopefully help with policy making. Uh, in terms of normal birth. Uh, this is the front cover of the, um, uh, the Royal College of Midwives, Royal College of Obstetricians and uh, Gynecologists in the UK. Uh, they had a working party which also very importantly included um, uh, maternity care consumers from the long-term activist organization, the National Childbirth Trust. And I think you see some of the important components in the picture uh, about normal birth. So um, here we'll get into a little bit more detail than the WHO set out in terms of an actual definition. Again, the first statement's probably very obvious. We've got, again, spontaneous labor, spontaneous progress without drugs, um, and giving birth spontaneously as a kind of um, uh, first category of the definition. But the, the British definition also says it's okay if there's augmentation of labor, ARM, some pain relief in labor, um, but does not include epidural. It does include EFM, interestingly, as we'll see in contrast to some other statements, um, active management of the third stage of labor, and um, also the fact that there may be some antenatal um, birth or postpartum complications. So beginning to question this concept of, for a normal birth, does everything have to be low risk, or can you have a normal birth in the midst of some other kind of complications? So you can see, although we all think we know what we mean when we say uh, normal birth, uh, it, ca it gets complex to try and define it. Um, this is what is not included in the British definition, so not induction by any means, not an epidural, uh, or general or spinal, uh, not an instrumental delivery or a cesarean section, and not an episiotomy. Um, there was debate, and it's interesting to read about this debate in Britain, um, there was debate about the fact that some of the members of the working party wanted to tighten up the definition um, to exclude things like augmentation, uh, the use of opioids, uh, the use of artificial rupture of the membranes, or managed third stage. Um, but in part, this was dependent on being able to collect the statistics. And we have those same kind of challenges of only being able to measure what we're collecting. And um, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that at the end in terms of some of the things we're trying to do with the BORN database. Um, and they do propose that um, a tighter definition could lead to the establishment of a separate definition from what we may call normal, and it's interesting, it evokes the meaning of normal less as physiologic, but the word normal perhaps as 
common with a separate definition more focused on the physiologic or natural birth. So it raises the question of whether having more than one category of normal birth um, is a good approach to take. And uh, this is a policy that I hope most of you are familiar with. If not, it's certainly a very interesting read. Um, and that's the Joint Policy Statement on Normal Childbirth. And the, this was uh, reviewed and approved by um, A1 Canada, by the Canadian Association of Midwives, and uh, the College of Family Physicians of Canada, as well as the Society of Rural Physicians. Um, and uh, it, this has not been without debate. Uh, as in the UK, there was a lot of debate both um, uh, during and following the publication of this statement. Um, the SOGC statement uh, has similarities, but also some important differences from the ones we've looked at so far. Um, again, we have spontaneous onset of labor. The idea of being low risk throughout, at the beginning of labor and throughout the labor. Um, again, vertex term. Um, it, what is introduced in the SOGC statement that's new is the idea that uh, skin to skin uh, between mother and baby and breastfeeding in the first hour after the birth is a part of normal birth. Um, they do go on to say, although it's low risk kind of at the onset of labor and during, that uh, postpartum complications um, and even uh, newborn complications don't exclude us from calling it a normal birth uh, in this way of defining it, um, and that uh, evidence-based intervention is appropriate. Um, and so then they go on to define a little bit more about what ev evidence-based interventions could be included in a normal birth under the uh, joint uh, definition. Uh, so it does include augmentation of labor. Um, it includes ARM as long as that's not to induce the labor. Um, the SOGC definition includes epidural. So that distinguishes it from the uh, UK definition. Um, and uh, of course, it also includes non-pharmacologic pain relief like the UK active management of the third stage is seen as a part of a, a the definition of normal uh, birth. Um, but the SOGC is different than the UK statement in that uh, it poses uh, intermittent auscultation as, the, uh, as part of the criteria for having um, achieved a normal birth. So it doesn't include um, elective induction of labor prior to 41 weeks. And interestingly, again, that's different than the UK, where um, induction of labor period is seen as uh, uh, not part of normal birth, whereas um, this is one uh, that the SOGC would probably define as uh, an evidence-based intervention that can be included uh, in the definition of normal birth as long as it's 41 plus weeks. Um, so uh, induction of labor prior to 41 weeks is not included, uh, a spinal, a general, an instrumental delivery, cesarean section. And um, some of the more challenging things in terms of the um, uh, uh, dilemmas that face us in terms of measuring, routine episiotomy is not included in the SOGC, um, but it's often hard uh, to tell from our databases whether or not an episiotomy is routine. Um, so routine episiotomy uh, uh, is not uh, included. Neither is continuous EFM for a low-risk birth. Now, these births are supposed to be lower, so assuming that continuous EFM is not included and fetal malpresentation is also not included in the SOGC joint definition. Um, the SOGC, like many of the statements, do uh, try to define some of the ways um, that are most effective uh, to try and uh, support normal birth. Um, so uh, continuity of care, 
trust and partnership, uh, uh, decision making and autonomy, uh, creating an intimate uh, birth environment. Oh, sorry, my slide's not showing me um, the headings that I put on. I guess that was uh, got lost a bit in the translation. This is actually not part of the SOGC definition, although the SOGC definition does involve um, promoting some of these best practices. The actual wording here is now from the Canadian Association of Midwives, and the little picture that provided the heading, sorry, for some reason got excluded on this slide. Um, so this is actually the wording that comes from the Canadian Association of Midwives about the kind of strategies and approaches that help facilitate normal birth. And uh, this is very much um, in common with some of the suggestions uh, from other normal birth statements. Uh, continuous support, these are all familiar themes to everyone within maternity care. Um, uh, choice of birthplace, as in the UK, the CAM statement emphasizes that, whereas the SOGC statement uh, doesn't put an emphasis on uh, uh, choice of birthplace. So what gets included and excluded? There's quite a bit of variation um, throughout the different kinds of statements. CAM uh, summarizes by um, uh, talking about trying to create the optimal conditions for the complex process of birth to unfold, creating that sense of safety and security in labor, and um, uh, therefore avoiding that cascade of interventions. And uh, I've just taken a few of the paragraphs from uh, the CAM uh, statement, uh, so there's the link if you want to read more about it. So now I'm going to talk just a little bit about some of the pros and cons of having normal birth statements at all, and um, uh, then I'm going to turn it over to Liz um, to talk about how we actually could try to measure. Um, one of the pros is that um, normal birth statements do actually name publicly for policymakers and for maternity care providers um, the fact that we have identified rising rates of intervention as a problem that we want to address. Um, they do take on to champion normal birth, and um, that flows from a lot of people being worried about the normalization of interventions and the need to kind of have a public profile for normal birth and uh, maybe even a public education campaign uh, to support normal birth. Um, I think one of the really strong things about the normal birth uh, statements is that they do, uh, they demonstrate and they role model uh, interprofessional collaboration when you have uh, the different organizations, all the different maternity care provider groups uh, working together to try and figure out um, these sometimes uh, contentious issues about what should be included and what shouldn't be included. Um, and they do, um, they do call for everyone to work together um, to educate the public to have more confidence in normal birth. And uh, this probably really got more intense after the big debate about cesarean section on demand and it, it, it appearing at least in um, pop culture and celebrity culture uh, that the idea of having a cesarean section without a medical indication might be becoming fashionable. I think a lot of the research really showed that that is not really very evidence-based and that the number of women who ask for that um, is really quite small. However, I think it pushed us all to think uh, about the fact that that conversation was even happening um, and that we really needed to help women feel confident in the process of birth. Um, this interprofessional collaboration also really pu has pushed um, to try and uh, ask maternity care providers to think about, and I'd really be interested in, to hear if in any of the hospitals or centers that you're working in, whether there's any move towards working on interdisciplinary policies to promote normal birth. Uh, there's a very, very new initiative at uh, the hospital where I work to try and take a look at that. Um, and um, 
it's very interesting to see that the normal birth statements really do try to use evidence-based practices that support normal birth. But as you can see, that's a bit uneven and sometimes contradictory. So um, are we uh, including EFM in low-risk births as the UK does in a normal birth? Well, um, someone certainly can have a spontaneous vaginal delivery uh, while uh, EFM is applied, but if the evidence says you don't need um, EFM in a, in a normal birth, should we include that or not? Um, that's where some of those contradictions come in. And certainly epidural is quite an interesting debate um, and often between the professions about whether that should be involved or not. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the difference across the Atlantic and what that might indicate about our maternity care systems. Um, I think one of the other important pros is that um, uh, there is a, a call in the normal birth statements to um, talk about best practices and possibly clinical practice guidelines that promote normal birth and that look at um, uh, maximizing normal birth as a really important outcome and one that can influence uh, how we interpret the evidence because often uh, evidence gives us choices and uh, if one of our goals is normal birth, um, it might influence uh, the kind of options that we offer uh, to women um, at various points in pregnancy and birth. Um, one of the other pros, I think, is um, promoting education and skills and um, uh, this positive focus on coping uh, with labor and with pain, um, there's been uh, a return to hoping to promote um, uh, VBAC, vaginal birth after cesarean section, um, again, after there was a big surge in that in the mid-90s, that kind of died away and it became uh, more like a menu-like option around VBAC. And uh, again, there is uh, a move with these normal birth statements to try and actually promote VBAC and, and uh, put it forward as, uh, as the best choice for healthy mothers and babies. Um, and the other thing the normal birth statements do is they really um, uh, ask care providers to help women to be informed and also bring back this idea of encouraging and supporting women uh, to experience a natural birth, a normal birth, and to understand the risks of unnecessary intervention. Again, a move away from a kind of neutral um, a number of options and actually promoting and encouraging normal birth as a, as a positive. Um, and inevitably, in, um, especially in interprofessional uh, forums, sometimes um, uh, this bullet point leads us to a discussion of um, whether or not, if we really encourage and support normal birth, whether or not there is the possibility um, that we are creating more disappointment um, or even guilt among women who are not able to achieve a normal birth. And so that's something we could certainly talk about um, if people want to include that in our time for questions. Um, Okay, but there's a few problems, and I'm going to finish up soon and hand over to Liz. Uh, but just to say before I end, there are a lot of questions about the normal birth statements, about trying to define and measure normal birth. Um, because of this lack of, lack of consensus and the problems with measurement, it really may limit the utility of um, anything but a kind of phil philosophical uh, promotion of normal birth. And so there's certainly some challenges we have uh, to work through in order to make the uh, m measurement and definition of normal birth as meaningful as possible. Um, there's this question about what uh, are we promoting normal as uh, uh, what's common, um, and that can lead to something like epidural being included or normal as natural. And um, are we talking about normal labor and birth or just a normal birth, i.e. normal delivery? And uh, the SOGC uh, statement does define these things quite differently. Um, they talk about normal labor, they talk about normal delivery, and they talk about natural as a subcategory of, uh, of normal birth. 
Um, and uh, these are questions that obviously have to be answered. Um, I think we all think um, that you can have a normal labor after a complicated pregnancy, and you can have a normal birth even after a complicated labor. And uh, I certainly many times as a midwife have said, hooray, you had a normal birth, especially after a complicated labor. So do we want to include that or don't we? Um, one of the concerns that's come up in some of the literature about defining normal birth is if we define it broadly, um, which there are definitely some arguments in favor of, could we do harm by normalizing interventions by, by labeling them as a normal birth? Um, we know that interventions can undermine physiologic labor and lead to abnormalities. So in that sense, we don't want to normalize intervention. And the normal birth statements in some ways would seem to be geared at um, avoiding the overuse of intervention. However, we all also know that interventions can prevent or correct abnormalities and help preserve normal bring birth back to normal, and certainly we want to promote and celebrate that judicious use of intervention and not necessarily exclude it from a definition of normal birth. Um, as midwives, we would normally uh, in, uh, define normal labor and birth as a birth without pharmacologic pain relief or augmentation and electronic fetal monitoring. And yet, as I just said, we will often define normalcy in individual and flexible ways um, in order to um, uh, maximize uh, every woman's sense of the normality that can be involved in even the most complicated births. And so the limitations, obviously, of statements and definitions are that they can't always address this kind of complexity and contradiction that's involved in the real life messiness of uh, working in maternity care. Um, just before I end my part of the presentation, I just wanted to share with you a couple of tools that we use in uh, uh, teaching in the midwifery program um, in terms of how we describe the different relationships that uh, care providers uh, can be involved in as they promote normal birth. Um, and going all the way from detecting abnormal and bringing birth back to normal uh, to doing education for, for normal birth and um, uh, avoiding unnecessary interventions. So it's, it's this complexity of different ways that we as maternity care providers relate to normal that I think provides us with challenges. Um, and I'm sorry if this is a little bit, um, uh, the, it's a little bit too small uh, in the text there. This is actually a slide that um, came out of some of my work in Nunavik, uh, where we have very, very high rates of normal birth. It's a young, multiparous population and uh, a traditional culture of confidence in normal birth. And um, in order to talk about the successes of um, returning birth to those small communities in Nunavik, uh, myself and my colleagues identified this kind of cycle of normality that helps people keep believing uh, in normal birth and uh, keeping risks in perspective, even though uh, the, the, um, the maternity system is choosing to promote birth um, far, far from uh, uh, level three kind of intervention. And uh, last but not least for me um, is one of, the, one of the important kind of hesitations, I think, uh, for Canadian healthcare providers um, around defining normal birth is that in almost every province, um, midwifery scope in, within legislation and regulation is often described as normal pregnancy, labor, and birth. And so just to say with a sense of caution that this use of the term normal in scope definitions was not meant to restrict midwifery participation in the care of women who have variations of normal or even abnormal labors um, within their midwifery competencies. So uh, the goal, obviously, of normal birth statements um, isn't to restrict 
uh, midwifery practice and really shouldn't be used to do that. And there was a bit of a flurry of controversy when the SOGCC statement first came out, endorsed by CAM, that perhaps it was defining a narrower scope for midwives than, for example, the College of Midwives of Ontario uh, guidelines. And um, so just a cautionary note, uh, in terms of midwifery practice, that uh, it is CMO standards, not normal birth statements, that guide midwives about when they consult uh, and continue care if everything's normal enough, and when they transfer care if it's not. Um, and a broad scope of practice for midwives to be involved in more than the strictly defined normal is uh, essential to give midwives the flexibility to play the role that they can uh, play within the diverse communities of Canada, uh, adapting to the complexity of childbirth, and also importantly, working in interprofessional models of care. Um, and that's the end of my slides, and um, I think there's plenty of time. Liz, are you okay to take over? Yep, that's great. Can people hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear you loud and okay. clear. Great. Sounds good, Liz. Um, so what, what I want to talk about with you next is the really exciting opportunity that we've had to take some of these ideas that Vicki's been um, reflecting on for the first part of our presentation and actually try and um, move forward with the recommendation that midwives need to be actually monitoring and evaluating how well we're doing against some of the definitions of normal birth. Um, and what, um, what I'm going to talk about is work that Vicki and I and other um, members of the midwifery community in Ontario have done in providing some recommendations to Born around how Born might be able to um, enhance and improve the reports that were previously available to midwives through the old um, MOR or midwifery outcome report system. Um, and look at providing new standard reports that any midwife will be able to access to look at her own outcomes or the outcomes of her whole practice group and the outcomes of the province. Um, and as we've heard, there really is a lot of, um, there's a lot of variation in people's ideas about normal birth and we really don't have a single consensus around what what the definition of normal birth should be. And so when we were talking about the idea of normal birth potentially being something new that we could offer as, as a thing that we could measure and midwives could, um, could have access to reports on, we really felt that it would be important not to just pick one definition and use it. Um, as Vicki mentioned, um, there are elements of the normal birth definition that was um, defined in the SOGC joint statement that maybe might not... Um, uh, match well with the ideas that many midwives might have about what would be a normal birth. Um, and so we, what, we, what we did was try and figure out a pretty pragmatic approach where we could look at normal birth based on the SOGC statement, since that is um, a national statement that all care providers are aware of in, in Canada, and then maybe look at some more tightly defined criteria that might align a little bit more closely with um, some of the ideas that midwives might have about what interventions um, might be included or excluded in, in a definition of normal birth. And we ended up coming up with three categories. So the first one is based on the SOGC, SOGC statement. And then what we called the other two are normal birth with minimal intervention and normal birth with no intervention. And I'm just going to move on to the next slides here and, and talk a little bit in more detail about what actually ended up getting included in those. As Vicki mentioned when she was talking about the, um, the definitions that various organizations have proposed, she identified that sometimes it actually is difficult um, for us to be measuring things. And even with the SOGC definition, um, we can't match everything exactly um, with how, how they're defined in, in, that, def in that definition um, just because of some of the challenges with, um, with measuring things. So, for example, um, one of the elements of the SOGC definition is the idea of no routine episiotomy. And as Vicki mentioned, we don't have data in the born database that tells us whether or not an episiotomy was done as a routine thing or whether there was um, an, inter an, an indication for that intervention that many of us might agree would be a reasonable indication. So what we've done in terms of um, uh, all the criteria that we've used is we've just been able to um, um, define this outcome based on whether or not 
an intervention was present or not, and we, we don't have the ability to look at the reasons for why they were done. Um, the other one also with the SOGC definition that's a little bit vague is the idea of no, no uh, EFM in low-risk pregnancies and, or a low-risk um, labor. And, you know, we, there, we can imagine situations where somebody's had a completely normal low-risk pregnancy and, for example, perhaps there's meconium in the fluid at, during the labor and EFM is used, the fetal heart rate remains normal, and everything else about the birth would meet the definitions of, of normal birth. Um, we had to make a decision about whether or not we would include EFM or not. And because we don't have uh, the ability to look at um, what the indications were for why EFM might have been started in each individual case, we had to make the decision to go with just excluding any, any cases where EFM are used. So the criteria for the first category um, are vertex presentation, uh, birth at term, so between 32 and 40, 37 and 42 weeks, sorry, um, a labor that's spontaneous in onset that includes a spontaneous vaginal birth. And as Vicki mentioned, one of the unique things about the SOGC statement compared to um, the statements in some other settings is that it does also include elements related to the immediate postpartum. Um, and so it includes skin to skin immediately after birth. And in terms of what we're able to actually measure and how the data is being captured and born, um, what we've used for now in terms of looking at um, breastfeeding is whether or not a baby had the opportunity to latch within the first hour or whether it was indicated that a latch was achieved in the, in the immediate postpartum. So I'm just going to move on to the next one. So this is our um, normal birth with minimal intervention. So we've excluded a few more things here. Um, the same criteria um, that were um, previously in the normal birth statement related to um, how the woman that is coming into labor are, are, are still present, but we've excluded a few more interventions. So in this category, um, any woman who has an augmentation of labor with any method other than an ARM would be excluded, um, and any births that use epidural or opioids would be excluded. Um, but we did leave nitrous oxide in. Um, and that, you know, some of these decisions in many ways are, are just subjective. Um, it, I think there's variation between, you know, individual practitioners around how they might rank interventions as which ones are more interventive than others. Um, part of our rationale for this was that um, nitrous is something that actually is available for midwives to use in out-of-hospital settings. Um, and um, so that's, you know, that's one difference in terms of access to that intervention. It might be seen a little bit more commonly, um, or it definitely would be more, more likely to happen in an out-of-hospital birth than, than forms of pain relief like epidurals and opioids, which aren't used. And then moving on to our final um, category, this is uh, normal birth with no intervention. Um, so the things that are further excluded here are um, any kind of uh, augmentation. So any labor that, experience, that includes ARM would be excluded. Um, and we also excluded nitrous in this category too. So this next slide is fresh, hot off the presses. Um, this is uh, an example of what the Born reports will actually look like. And we also, we do have, um, I think both Dana and Sydney, uh, sorry, Dana and Vi Vivian on the line with us today, and um, they've both been doing a lot of the work at Bourne and actually creating the reports um, that that we had, um, you know, suggested. And um, so this report will hopefully be available for midwives to be accessing quite soon. It's just in the very final stages of testing. Um, what you see here is a is sort of a cleaned up version of it. When you actually get a report, there is more information that. Um, is presented below the table that gives you details around um, who's included in, in the definition. So it tells you a little bit about what the, what the numerator and denominator is for, for these measurements. Um, but basically this one is um, looking at midwifery clients in the whole province. And we start on the, uh, on the, um, the left-hand column with looking at all women um, who gave birth, and then the three categories to the right of that um, look at the percentage of those women that had normal birth according to roughly the SOGC criteria, our middle category of normal birth with minimal interventions, and then in the far um, right-hand column you can see the normal birth with no interventions. And if you look across, um, uh, the, you, know, you can see that the, uh, the proportion of 
women experiencing um, normal birth according to those different criteria does decrease, as, as one might expect, as you move across to less and less intervention. Um, this table also allows you to compare what the outcomes were um, based on the planned place of birth and the actual place of birth. So not surprisingly, again, you can see that um, the rates of normal birth are higher for women who um, plan home birth and also for women who actually end up with a home birth. Um, the reports will also be available um, broken down by parity. So this next slide is just showing you the same table, um, but restricted just to primiparous women. Um, and uh, I think this will be interesting for midwives to be able to, to look at as well and um, to make comparisons between primiparous and multiparous women. And I'll, I'll move on to the, um, to the next slide here, which is just the slide for, um, for multiparous women. Um, and so again, uh, um, we see very high rates of, of normal birth for multiparous women um, across all settings. Um, and, uh, and again, sort of um, as we get more restrictive in our definitions, there are, are, are a smaller portion of women who meet the criteria of the definitions that, that we've proposed. So we can move back to those slides uh, later on if people have specific questions about them. But just in terms of, of wrapping up, I think it, it, we would really like to have the opportunity to hear input and, and questions from people about what we've presented, particularly around our proposals for how we might um, go about measuring normal birth. And, and these reports will be available for people to start using fairly soon. Um, the question of our uh, that we posed in, in this presentation was whether or not um, defining and measuring uh, normal birth will help to keep birth normal and to promote birth to be normal. And um, so I think we're really interested. We don't have the answer to that question yet, um, but these reports will will um, provide us with the opportunity to to be examining that question um, and to be looking at you know what value midwives find in actually um, measuring and looking at their own outcomes. Um, I think the other exciting uh, opportunity. Uh, that's um, available with uh, this, um, these measurements is that all of the variables that we're using are variables that are being collected for all the births in the province. Um, so although this report is initially being rolled out as a standard report that midwives will be able to access, it will be quite easy for um, in the future for that to be adapted so that hospitals can be looking at the same kinds of measurements. Um, and um, you know, looking at their outcomes at a hospital level. And it also will be possible um, for us to be looking at comparisons across provider groups and that kind of thing. Um, so I think I, that's everything we have. So I will, uh, I will stop there, and uh, people are welcome to um, type in their questions if you have any questions or comments. And um, as I said, uh, Vicki and I are here, but also um, Dana and Vivian are around as well. So if people have specific questions related more to the details at the born end of things, um, they're available to answer those kinds of questions too. Thanks so much, Liv and Vicki. What a wonderful presentation. Very, very informative, <clears throat> certainly from my perspective, for sure, and I'm sure for all of the listeners on the line. So will we, I've just checked. We don't have any, uh, any questions just yet. Uh, but I'll just remind um, the audience to please type your question into the chat box, the lower left-hand corner of your screen, and we'll scroll through uh, the questions uh, posed for uh, Liz or Vicki or, as Liz said, Dana uh, or Vivi with respect to the Bourne Report. I, just while we wait, I actually uh, do have a question, so maybe I'll start the ball rolling. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering, you spoke a lot about the different professional groups and the definitions uh, devised with respect to normal birth, but I'm wondering what consumers perceive normal birth to be and how that was taken into consideration with respect to the reports that have been developed and your decisions around following the three uh, uh, types of definitions, the SOGGC definition. Uh, normal birth with minimal intervention, normal birth with n no intervention. Do, do, do you have a sense of how consumers perceive themselves to have, uh, you know, had a normal birth uh, given a variety of different 
fairly uh, minimal interventions that sometimes are excluded in some of these definitions. Do you have any thoughts about that? Or That's a great question. I do, I know, only know a little bit about this from the literature. It's not, um, uh, it's not well discussed in the literature that I've read in any case. But in the uh, discussion around the uh, British document, the, um, you know, I had that one slide that did say that there was a little bit of dissent uh, from that more broad definition and the desire for a more narrow definition. And that came in part from uh, people involved in the Nat National Childbirth Trust who were trying to um, uh, uh, collaborate uh, or, or push forward for a more strict definition of, of normal birth. Now there, you could define that group as activists, those people involved in childbirth education, not necessarily um, uh, surveying uh, the public as a whole about how they would define normal birth. That sounds like a great PhD thesis to me. <laughs> well, yeah. I'll, I'll just leave it for somebody to do that. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, Vicki. Uh, we do have a number of questions here, so I'll just start to um, to prompt you. Uh, from the Peel and Halton Midwifery Care Group, we have a question. I'm very excited by this initiative. We've been developing a health system on a page and provider on a page report at our hospital to look at these kinds of quality indicators. I proposed normal births for us, and we were planning to collect for the future. I guess that's what that is. <clears throat> So that's great. It sounds like these reports may be uh, useful to that group. Uh, Brittany Irvin says, hi, I'm just wondering about the choice in the report to use other rather than birth center. Uh, any thoughts on that or comments on that? I think that's really just how the, um, how the definitions have been set up for now. We don't actually don't have any births that have happened at the birth center that are included in in these um, in these reports, um, so because they're looking at data from a little while back, um, but I, I think that that's that once we have births that occur at the birth center, then that line will appear in the reports. Okay, thanks, Liz. Uh, Heather says she would like some of the slides to make into posters for her clinic. Well, the slides certainly will be uh, posted along with the webinar. I think probably uh, you'll need to contact uh, Vicki and Liz about using them in another in another format. Is that fair, Vicki and Liz? Yeah, sure, Heather. You have my email. You know how to find me. Okay. Uh, again, um, another comment from Peel and Halton Midwives on a page report already. I'm not quite sure about that. What I thought about, however, immediately was that if we really want to make an impact, provincially normal births should be on the hospital dashboards, and that will create incentive for hospitals to work as partners in focusing on normal births. And I think, Liz, you commented near the end about the idea of looking at, um, you know, modified versions or the feasibility of these reports uh, to be uh, prepared for uh, or accessible for hospital births. I don't know if you have more to add on that, or, or Dana and Vivi have any comments on that plan. Yeah, I think I think probably it's my understanding is it's not it's they won't be available immediately, um, and in some ways we can pilot the the reports um, with midwives and get feedback and figure out um, whether there are, are changes that might be made. But I think that. It is something that that will be um, fairly straightforward once um, once these reports are are up and working to make available for for other um, settings. Yeah, I see. Dana has just said that she's muted. She's waiting to be unmuted. So sorry to put you on the spot, Dana. I'll just make a, I'll just make a comment about Hi. the born dashboard. Just a sec before you go. There is a, a, a certainly a review process to look at the feasibility of adding key performance indicators to um, maternal, the maternal newborn dashboard. And um, in fact, in the future, this may be a topic uh, or an indicator that um, is brought forward. But at this point, it, um, it's part of this. So I think launching the report practice group uh, 
uh, will be the beginning um, uh, process to look at uh, the use and, and uh, value. Go ahead, Dana, is that you? Uh, yes, hello, everybody. Um, I just wanted to add on um, rolling these out to hospital users. We would just need to sit down and look at which categories work, which don't, rather than looking at place of birth. I think it's, it would be very interesting to look at provider attending at birth. So it certainly is on the list for the future, and I'm sure people will be hearing for us as we develop those. So it's great to hear that there's interest. And also, to, I wanted to speak to Heather's desire to hang these up. Um, they, they, as we said, they've, we're in the final, final moments of testing, and they should be rolled out soon, which means you'll be able to run them when you're logged in in Born on your own data. Um, and so you'll actually be able to print and post your own data in your clinic if you'd like to. Um, thanks, Dana. Uh, Maria asks, how do you address attribution of care when there is interdisciplinary collaboration for management of high-risk women who need normal birth definition? I could speak to that right now for the current reports. I don't know if Liz or Vicki would prefer to answer. Who needs the normal birth definition? That's story. Yeah, so I think that right now we're looking at um, we're just looking at births that are um, that were cared for by midwives. So if somebody was um, began labor under the care of a midwife, then they're included in the report. There certainly could have been this is Dana again. There could have been collaboration during the care that wouldn't exclude the women, but. Uh, the reports are drawn on courses of care that midwives in Ontario have billed for. That's how they're defined. So um, that would change on a hospital report or if we were looking at a variety of providers. The other thing is that um, these reports were specifically run on women in a low-risk profile. So that 37 to 42 weeks vertex presentation, singleton, no previous section, um, we started with that as the denominator. I just wanted to make sure that that was clear. Uh, there's another comment from Peel and Halton. The reality is that with multiple demands and limited resources, hospitals tend to focus on things that there is pressure to adhere to, uh, the dashboard items, provincial queue, quality um, based uh, practice uh, initiatives. Would be great to have normal birth as one of those. Uh, Yes, or that um, that would be interesting. Certainly, from uh, the born dashboard perspective, um, it is brought to our provincial subcommittee for discussion in the future, along with other uh, best practice uh, indicators. Um, and Sprague, just a note back to Brittany that birth centers won't immediately show up on these reports as they still are a demonstration. So not yet fully integrated into the, uh, into the bone information system. That perhaps explains um, that. Um, I'm going to just move over to another box. I have a number of boxes up on my screen. Andrea uh, made the comment regarding the definition of normal, opportunity, and or lack of power. There may be reasons why this isn't possible, and she uh, provides a number of examples, mastectomy, anatomical anomaly, women's choice. I'll exclude her from normal. Seems this is a lost opportunity for both. Any comments on that? Um, yes, I don't mind commenting on that, Andrea. Yeah, I think what you're pointing out is some of the complexity. I think it's not unlike Liz's example where uh, despite there being meconium stained fluid and a decision to use EFM to monitor the baby, everything else is normal. I know many of us as, as midwives would react and say, but that was a normal birth. We would, we would cheer for the normalcy, maybe even more than if there wasn't meconium, and certainly in the cases that you're raising. And within Born, we do have a little bit of a definition uh, around uh, people who aren't breastfeeding, and maybe that could be looked at to um, not to exclude uh, people for whom uh, breastfeeding is not an option. 
for example. These are the kind of details that really do need to get worked out, and it's one of the reasons I think it's great that we can try this out as midwives um, and uh, see what what works and why, and uh, then maybe share our insights with the rest of the maternity care community. Thank you, Vicki. Um, I believe I have scrolled through all the comments on the little boxes on my screen so far. Uh, we just have one more minute left, and if I may, um, I just wondered if there's a thought, although the reports present current rates uh, of normal birth based on the three different definitions you're using. Is there a thought in the future um, to set benchmarks? Is there an expectation of what midwifery practice groups uh, or, or midwifery um, client care in the province, what the benchmark should be? Uh, what would be the goal versus just seeing where you stand uh, in the province from a, from these rates, the portion of women who actually fall into these normal categories. This is Liz. I, I think we might still be a few steps away from doing that. I think part of um, part of the initial hope is that when midwives get these reports, uh, it just encourages them to look at what they're actually doing and to reflect on um, you know what the various rates of intervention are that are affecting their normal birth rates according to these these definitions, and as Vicky mentioned, it's it, it's not a it's not a simple thing where we can say absolutely the absence of intervention is always the best thing, um, and we also potentially um, may have variations in in the populations that are being served by midwifery practices in different areas and. There are a number of different factors that will, would go into what might be an ideal rate in one context versus in another. So I, th I think we're st we still need to understand more about what's going on. Um, I think that hopefully the act of measuring these things will encourage people to reflect on the interventions that are occurring and to make sure that they are justifiable. But, um, yeah, I again, I just think sometimes... As, as Vicki mentioned in her discussion, we know that um, interventions that are used judiciously at an appropriate time can sometimes, you know, help to um, put a stop to a cascade of, of further intervention. And so, um, setting absolute rates might still be something that's that's um, a little ways off, and, and potentially not even something that we ever um, would be able to agree upon in an evidence-based, meaningful way. Thank you, Liz, uh, and it's just past 1 o'clock now, so um, our time is up for this month's session, and I just want to thank our speakers so much from all, all of the audience and from those of us at Bourne for taking the time and coming uh, and, and speaking with us and sharing this wonderful presentation. We appreciate it. Uh, thank you all for, for signing on and, and uh, joining us today. Uh, our Bourne Provincial Rounds, again, will run uh, in April, the third Thursday in April. Stay tuned early April for the uh, announcement that will come out. And I wish you all a great afternoon and uh, a super day. We'll talk to you next month. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody.